Bonjour et bienvenue à tous. My name is Isabelle Leroux and I'm the president of the Federation of the Alliance Française USA and also a board member of the Alliance Française Miami Metro. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the third talk in the much anticipated new series, The Great Churches of Paris, the evolution of the church and ecclesiastical architecture in Paris from the Middle Ages to today with Russell Kelly. Following the success of the Grand Château of the Loire and Ile-de-France, and the making of the French Garden series of online talks, Russell Kelly spent the summer visiting the most beautiful churches of Paris. Our curator, Extraordinaire, returns to offer six talks replete with information about an important, another, another important pillar of France cultural and architectural heritage, the extraordinary variety of churches that were built in every commune in France, but especially in Paris over the past 1,000 years. Today, we will learn about the Renaissance churches and the Baroque churches of the Counter-Reformation with the Dome Church of Les Invalides as a shining example. But before we get static, started, I just want to tell you about the Federation uh, Alliance Française USA. We are a non-profit organization representing and providing educational and cultural resources for the 107 chapters in the US. The Federation supports and inspires its member chapters to promote the French language and Francophone culture. This theory is possible thanks to the Alliance Française de Chicago and the Alliance Française Miami Metro and the support of their communication partners, the Association of American Women in Europe, the French Heritage Society, and the Fondation La Sauvegarde de l'Art Français. A few words about Russell. Russell Kelly is the curator and moderator of the past two winter Zoom lecture series on the Grand Château of the Loire and Ile-de-France and the making of the French Garden. He has lived in Paris for 30 years and is the author of The Making of Paris, the story of how Paris evolved from a fishing village into the world's most beautiful city. Russell, c'est à vous. Merci, Isabelle. So today's lecture will talk about two important periods in French history, the Renaissance and the Baroque period. But as we shall see, the church building in the Renaissance period was dramatically affected in the 15th, 16th century by first the Reformation and then the wars of religion. And it was only in the 17th century and 18th century, that church building came surging back with the late arrival of the Counter-Reformation. So two periods we're gonna be talking about here. And this is the third of our six lectures. And we will see how church building or church uh, design evolved now from the Gothic Notre Dame to the very Baroque Dome Church des Invalides. But in between, there were the Renaissance churches of Paris in the 16th century. And it all started with the Renaissance king of France, Francois Premier. He got that name because he brought the Renaissance from Italy to France following his Italian wars. And the period that he first went to Italy was the high Renaissance of Italy, where of course the Renaissance period started in the Quattrocento in 1400. Uh, as soon as Francois Premier became king in 1550, the first thing he did was to carry on the, the Italian wars with a victory at the Battle of Marignan Uh, he was, went to Italy for the first time. He discovered Italian Renaissance architecture, gardens, paintings, textiles, and he brought back the artisans from all of those domains to France. He also, one of the artists he brought back was Leonardo da Vinci, who spent the last four years of his life living at Clos Lucet next to the Chateau d'Amboise, and he brought with him the Mona Lisa La Jaconde, which now sits in, in, in the Louvre. Um, Francois Premier was responsible for lots of French 
Renaissance Chateau in the Loire Valley and also in the Ile de France. And there were a number of Renaissance architects in France. The first two, Cortona and Primaticcio, actually were Italian, uh, but Lesco, Delorme, and Boulon uh, were French designing in the, Italian, uh, the Renaissance style. All of their wonderful works and more were recorded in a wonderful series of sketches by Jacques Andouet du Cerceau in his book, his two volume work, Les Plus Excellents Bâtiments de France. When Francois Premier went to Italy, this is the kind of church he would have discovered. The Pienza Cathedral, the cathedral in Pienza, which has a, a typical early Renaissance facade, two stories topped by a triangular pediment, rounded arches, blind arches uh, with columns and pilasters. But there are no Renaissance churches in Paris per se, only Gothic churches with Renaissance elements. Why is that? Well, things got started to, on a pretty good footing after the victory at Marignan. Uh, Francois Premier um, had interviews with the Pope, Leo X, I believe it was, uh, and reached an agreement with him regarding the management of the church in France, uh, which had been a to and fro affair throughout the centuries who had more control and the under, under the understanding of the Concordat of Bologna, the Pope collected all income from the Catholic Church in France, but Francois Premier appointed the archbishops, the bishops, the abbots, the priors of the, of the monasteries, even though the uh, Pope retained veto power. So it looked like a promising start to the century in terms of uh, an understanding between the church and the state. But all of a sudden things unraveled uh, with the arrival of the Protestant Reformation, literally the year after the Concordat uh, of Bologna with the, uh, with the arrival of Martin Luther on the scene with his 95 theses, which provoked the Reformation followed by the counter Reformation, which was not just a Europe, uh, French thing. It was certainly, it was a European phenomenon that began in 1545 and carried on. But all of that was overshadowed by the French wars of religion, which went on through the end of the century and beyond. So the Reformation started with the, when Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses to the church door in Wittenberg and his main complaint was about the corruption of the church, the Catholic Roman Catholic Church, particularly the sale of indulgences. He was condemned uh, by the Pope at the uh, or not, at the Diet of Worms, but he he was not uh, he was able to continue living in freedom. He was not burned at the stake, which might have happened if he had not had the protection of the princes of the Holy Roman Empire. Certain of the princes of the Holy Roman Empire. He went on to translate the Bible into German in 1522, the New Testament in 1534, the Old Testament, in other words, the vernacular, which was not approved of by the church. It's because he touched a nerve uh, with his uh, opposition to the corruption in the Catholic church, uh, Luther's Protestantism spread quickly around Europe to Switzerland, to the Low Countries. In England, it wasn't a spread of Protestantism as it so much as it was just a separation from the Roman church and the creation of a new church of England by Henry VIII in 1534. And France, it took off in a significant way um, and peaked at 2 million Protestants in 1572, which represented roughly 10% of the population and significantly 40% of the nobility. At first, uh, Francois Premier had a muted reaction to the Reformation. He took no particular action. He was quite tolerant uh, for the first 15, 20 years until the Affaire des Placards. 
And then he proved how intolerant he was with the suppression of the Vaudois heretics. And his son, Henri Quatre, Henri II, doubled down on it with the creation of what was known as the Chambre Ardente. The Affaire des Placards was a, a polemic. It was, that is the poster on the left. It was basically a pamphlet that was nailed on a bunch, uh, many, many uh, buildings around France, including the residence of Francois Premier. It was a polemic against the Catholic Church. And that dramatically ended Francois Premier's policy of conciliation with the Lutherans of France, as they were then known. Uh, it also provoked the flight from France to Switzerland of Jean Calvin, who later was known as John Calvin, um, who was a French theologian who uh, embraced uh, Protestantism, but quickly after he realized that his uh, time had come, uh, he went into exile in Switzerland, ultimately settling in Geneva. And it was from there that he developed his theology uh, of French Calvinism, Calvinism, which spread throughout Southwest France and into the Netherlands in particular. And the French Calvinists um, were known as Huguenots. So after that, 10 years after that, uh, Francois Premier uh, was responsible for what was known as the suppression of the Vaudois or the Valdensian heretics, which were an early form of Protestants that originated in Lyon and they settled in the Luberon region, um, industrious, hardworking people. And Francois Premier ordered their slaughter. Uh, up to 3,000 of these Vaudois heretics, Protestants, were massacred, and 20 villages in the Luberon were burned to the ground. The dark uh, points on the slide indicate the villages in the Luberon, the wonderful, beautiful Luberon that is so popular with tourists today, that were flattened uh, by Francois Premier in the suppression of the Vaudois heretics. Why did he do that? Well, one of the reasons why he did it was because Francois Premier had allied with Suleiman the Magnificent of the Ottoman Empire against Charles V, Charles Quint, of the Holy Roman Empire in 1536. This was, as you can imagine, an extremely controversial alliance uh, with a Muslim um, sultan against the leader of the Holy Roman Empire. So some people consider that the, the suppression of the Vaudois heretics was a way for Francois Premier to burnish his reputation as a Catholic uh, and tamp down this controversy relating to the Franco-Ottoman alliance. Francois Premier was succeeded by his son Henri II, who had married Catherine de Medici from Florence in 1533. And Henri II carried on his father's anti-Protestant policies with the creation of the Chambre Ardente, the fiery chamber, which was a, a court uh, he established to try heretics. In fact, it was a... Um, Francois Premier uh, was raised uh, in the same chateau in Amboise with Anne de Montmorency. Anne, even though it's now used as a lady's name, uh, it was a man's name, male name, forename uh, in the old days. And Anne was named after his godmother, Queen Anne de Bretagne. He rose uh, to prominence under the reign of Francois Premier, fell out of favor, but he came back in favor with Henri II, with Henry II, and he was a staunch Catholic, was Montmorency. Henri II was injured while joust jousting uh, next to his palace in Paris on the Rue Saint-Antoine Saint on June 30th. Um, a, the lance broke when it hit his helmet and a splinter of it went through the eye hole into his eye. And he died 10 days later uh, at the Palais des Tournelles uh, right next door. 
leaving his widow, Catherine de Medici, with her four children. They would become, all of his sons would become kings and his daughter would become a queen. But they were young and they were not particularly strong kings. Therefore, they were easily manipulated as was the whole monarchy by power, what I call power brokers on the left and on the right or on the ultra Catholic side, the names that will come up again are our friend Anne de Montmorency who came, fell in and out of favor. Uh, and he was largely supplanted by the house of Guise first Francois, Duc de Guise, and then his son, Henri, Duc de Guise, and Francois's brother, Charles, Cardinal de Lorraine. And after his death, his son, Louis de Cardinal de Guise. And the third member is Jacques d'Albon, the Maréchal de Saint-André. Uh, we'll mention these uh, three later. On the Huguenot side, there was Condé and Coligny. We'll introduce them momentarily. So Francois de succeeded his father, Henri de, at the age of 14, 15. He had married Mary, Queen of Scots at Notre Dame in the, uh, the year before. Uh, even though he was nominally uh, old enough to take power, in fact, he delegated power to Mary's uncles, Francois, Duc de Guise, and Charles, his brother, the Cardinal de Lorraine, who I mentioned on the two previous slides. Francois de Lorraine uh, had been raised with Henri II, just like Anne de Montmorency was raised with Francois Premier. He was a successful general in the Italian wars that Henri II carried on after his father. And he was the leader of the ultra Catholic triumvirate, as it was known, which included. Anne de Montmorency and the Maréchal de Saint-André. And he exercised extraordinary power uh, over the young King Francois II. And the Protestants uh, opposed the power of the, of the very ultra Catholic Guise family over the King. And in order to replace uh, them, uh, they conspired to take uh, to basically take control of the monarchy and, and expel the House de Guise. Uh, their conspiracy was discovered and um, was thwarted by the Duc de Guise. The um, um, was, uh, the uh, Protestants uh, attacked the Amboise, Chateau d'Amboise, uh, where Francois II was, but the troops were waiting for them and they were massacred and it led to up to 1,200 Huguenots being executed. Many of them hung literally from the parapets of the Chateau d'Amboise. The leader of the Huguenot uh, was Louis de Bourbon, a prince de sang, which means that he was a heir to the, one of the younger brothers of the king directly in line uh, conceivably for in, uh, succession to the throne, uh, which happened for later Prince du Song, namely the Duc d'Orléans uh, after uh, in the 19th century. Uh, he was arrested by Guise for instigating the Amboise conspiracy, but luckily for him, the very young Francois II died while uh, Condé was in, in, uh, under arrest and what, Guise lost power uh, when uh, Francois II was replaced by his next younger brother and the Duke, uh, Prince de Condé was released. The other important Protestant leader was Gaspard de Coligny, also known as the Admiral de Coligny uh, because France actually did have a navy and that was a very high title. Uh, following the Amboise conspiracy, he rather moderately pushed for an assembly of notables and proposed to endorse coexistence between ex Catholics and Protestants, which was fiercely resisted by the House of Guise. François de was succeeded by his even younger brother, uh, uh, Charles the Ninth, Charles Neuf, 
Uh, and instead of the Guise uh, having control over the government, his mother uh, had control. Marie, it should be Cat Catherine, sorry, not Marie de Medici. Catherine de Medici was appointed gouvernante de France, which is equivalent to regent. And she had an initial policy of tolerance towards the uh, Huguenot, which was opposed by the triumvirate led by our friend de Guise, the Duc de Guise. Shortly thereafter, the Duc de Guise was responsible for the massacre of between 50 and 100 Protestant worshipers at a church uh, in the town of Vassy. And that started the wars of religion. There are eight different wars, might have been nine, might have been 10, depending on how, how you believe it. I'm going to stick with eight. Um, the Duc de Guise, very unpopular, as you can imagine, with the Protestants, uh, particularly after the Massacre de Vassy, was ass assassinated by the Huguenot Jean de Poltot the year later. And Coligny, the Protestant leader, was suspected of involvement. Poltot was drawn and quartered after being tortured to find out if, if Coligny was in fact responsible for the assassination attempt. Um, it was not clear uh, whether he was or not. In any event, he escaped uh, without being arrested. Uh, Coligny replaced Condé as the head of the Huguenot rebels uh, after the Battle of Jarnac, where Condé was killed in 1569. Next big event, 1572, the marriage at Notre Dame of the Huguenot, Henri III de Navarre, and the Papist Catholic Marguerite de Valois, the daughter of Francois, of, uh, Francois I, sorry, of Henri II. There's the kingdom of Navarre at the very southwest corner of France. Uh, over it also extended into the kingdom, uh, was now the Spain. Marguerite de Valois was married by herself at Notre Dame because Henri de Navarre, being a Protestant, couldn't go in. So he waited outside. He had a proxy say, I do, uh, at the ceremony at Notre Dame. So, Oh, six days after the wedding, there was the massacre on St. Bartholomew's Day. Hundreds, if not thousands of Huguenots had come to uh, Paris to celebrate this wedding. And the, the Duc de Guise, uh, or the, the Protestants, sorry, the Catholics took this opportunity. They were concerned that there would be another revolt, uh, uh, another cons conspiracy like the Amboise conspiracy. So in order to preempt that, um, Marie de Medici, sorry, Catherine de Medici, who changed her mind, she went from being tolerant to being uh, rabidly anti-Protestant uh, and agreed and pushed her son to order the massacre. Uh, the bells rang at Saint the church that we talked about last, one of the churches that we talked about in the last two weeks, Saint Germain de l'Auxerrois, just next to Notre Dame. And the slaughter began. This is a composite photo that uh, shows a lot of different things in a very small space that weren't there in reality, including in black on the left, uh, Catherine de Medici and hanging from the window the Amiral de Coligny. Amiral de Coligny had in fact entered France on August 2nd and he was shot from a window and injured. And on then uh, on uh, St. Bartholomew's Day, he was uh, taken from his bed and defenestrated um, and then mutilated. All in all, uh, th this massacre extended well beyond Paris to all of France, and nobody knows the numbers exactly, but it's tens of thousands of Huguenot uh, were slaughtered in the next, in the following weeks. But luckily for Henri de Navarre, the bridegroom, uh, he survived. 
so uh, the third king um, of the three sons of, of Henri II was Henri III. And he did not have a, an heir, no son or daughter. Um, so Henri de Navarre, uh, cousin, all of a sudden became the presumptive heir. This was anathema, needless to say, to the ultra-Catholic group, now led by Henri I, Henri I, Duc de Guise, who was the son of Francois, the one who had been uh, killed earlier. And the new Duc de Guise founded the Catholic League in 1576. And he led what was known as the War of the Three Henrys, which is the eighth and final war of religion, depending on how you count them. The three Henrys were Henri de Navarre, the Protestant leader, Henri Toi, the king, and Henri de Guise, the head of the ultra Catholics and the Catholic League. Um, uh, the day of the barricades in Paris, uh, May 12, 1588, was a Catholic pro protest orchestrated by the Duc de Guise in opposition to the, what were considered by the Duc de Guise to be the insufficiently strong anti-Protestant policies of Henri Toi. Henri uh, Toi was concerned, rightly so, uh, that the Duc de Guise had designs on his throne. And to preempt that, Henri Toi had the Duc de Guise assassinated in his, at, at his chateau uh, in Blois in 1588. And his brother, the Duc de Guise's brother, Louis de Cardinal de Guise, was assassinated the following day, removing the, the threat of the House de Guise uh, to the throne. Henri Toi was in turn assassinated the following year by a Catholic monk, Jacques Clément. So all three sons of Henri de died without issue, ending the House of Valois and leading to, amazingly, the arrival of Henri IV, a Protestant, as King of France. There are then ensued what I, I separated from the other wars of religion, but it's a, essentially a continuation of the wars of religion against the Catholic League, which went on for four long years, uh, and until finally, Henri IV converted to Catholicism at the cathedral, at the Basilica of Saint Denis in 1593, famously saying, Paris vaut bien une messe. Paris, Paris is well worth a, mess, a mass. So he entered Paris finally in 1594. 1595, this is a picture, an equestrian, uh, equestrian portrait of Henri IV. Uh, with Montmartre behind it, with the abbey on top of it, and the Louvre behind him, so we're looking north. Here's another equestrian uh, rendition of Henri IV at the western end of the Ile de la Cité, on the Pont Neuf, which was built or finished at least by Henri IV. He was a great builder, was Henri IV. He built the Pont Neuf, he built the Place Dauphine next to the Pont Neuf, he built the Grand Galerie du Louvre, which is to the left of this photo, uh, stretching between the Cour Carré and the Palais des Tuileries. He built the Place Royale, known as the Place des Vosges. He built the Hôpital Saint Louis. He was the first great urban builder of Paris, but he built no churches whatsoever. So in, in fact, during the 16th century, there were only Gothic churches with Renaissance elements. And the two that I will focus on are Saint Eustache and Saint Etienne du Mont. What is the French Renaissance style? Well, it recalls and it imported, let's remember from Italy, uh, the elements from classical Roman architecture, columns, pilasters with Roman orders, round arches with decorative elements. The Eglise Saint Eustache. 
the second largest church in Paris after Notre Dame. Located in Léal. It was the last Gothic church built in Paris and it was modeled on Notre Dame, as you can see. The Léal, it was the Paris church for Léal, which was the biggest church in Paris. It was always the marketplace uh, from the very early Middle Ages. Very Gothic uh, exterior with flying buttresses. The south facade was actually the main entrance. Here's the south facade overlooking what is now known as the Jardin Nelson Mandela. And from the outside, the, the, the only really Renaissance element is the south portal. The west facade Here's the west facade, which is not used as the primary entrance and never, never was with its unfinished south tower in a very different style. There was a plan to actually build a Renaissance facade. And this is the design of Du Cerceau for that facade, but it was never built. In fact, the original west facade was built in the Gothic style, but ultimately uh, it was demolished This is a photo of the Gothic facade in 1730, not a photo, an image of the, uh, from the, uh, in 1739 of the Gothic facade that we just saw. And that this, let me take this opportunity to introduce to you the Plan de Turgot, which was published in 1739 by the prefect of the Seine Turgot, uh, but the cartographer, cartographer who made this amazing bird's eye view map of France and Paris rather, that I will be showing lots and lots of excerpts of in this presentation uh, was Louis Brutez. So the Gothic facade of uh, Saint Eustache was demolished and it was replaced by a new facade designed by Louis Laveau with columns in the classical style. It was never completed as you can see the South Tower uh, was not built, but it does have the wonderful classical style of paired columns on two levels, ionic columns on the upper level with Doric columns on the lower level. Inside the nave, extremely high ceilings, higher than Notre Dame. The decorations are in the hybrid, uh, in hybrid style flamboyant Gothic vaults, which we will see, which is extremely ornamental. And instead of having pointed arches along the arcades, uh, they are semicircular. Flamboyant Gothic arches with a lot of elaborate ribs, which uh, many of which are decorative and a famous hanging keystone, clay pendant, in the center, highly decorative again. The semicircular arches in the Renaissance style. Some photos of the location of the church in the Cartier des Halles. And marked in blue is where Les Halles, uh, were built by Baltar, uh, were, were built by Baltar. This is the first pavilion of Leal. It was so clunky, it was known as the Four de la Halle. Uh, Napoleon III hated it. So it was replaced by the new version of the pavilions that you see here. The round dome of the Bourse de Commerce on the top, the Fontaine des Innocents, both of those are still there. Uh, what's in between these three items has changed a lot, however. Now you have the canapé uh, at one end of that, uh, what used to be Leal, uh, the pavilions, which was finished in 2016, this giant floating roof over the uh, shopping center and uh, transportation hub. And then at the bottom, you have the, the round, magnificent Bourse de Commerce, which became opened as the Fondation Pinot 
in 2021. The Église Saint-Étienne du Mont was built next to the Abbey Church of the Abbé uh, Saint Geneviève, and it represents a transition from the flamboyant Gothic style to the Renaissance style. It's located just behind the Pantheon. And it went through many, many, it wasn't uh, stages of construction. The new church was to be built in the flamboyant Gothic style way back in 1492, but it took a long time to be finished. And a hundred years later, the uh, styles had changed. Uh, so they built the nave and the transept in the end in the new Renaissance style, as well as this facade. Something that happens frequently in, in churches buildings because they take so long to build, styles change, and, and uh, the churches often reflect that. So as I mentioned, the Abbey Saint Geneviève, uh, founded in 506 on the Montaigne Saint Geneviève, the Abbey Church was rebuilt uh, in the 11th century. That's what you see here with the Tour Clovis, Clovis behind it. just inside the Philippe Auguste wall on the right. The Abbey Church was demolished in 1802 to make room for now what is the Rue Clovis. Here's that Plan de Turgot uh, map again, which shows Saint Etienne Church, uh, the, uh, the arrow at the bottom left. Uh, the next one up is the Abbey Church, which was demolished in 1802. And then at, at the top is the Clure Clovis, which is now inside the Lycée Henri IV. The church, uh, saint Etienne du Mont, is in a very irregular shape. You, you can't really tell when you're in it, but it, but it is an exceptionally irregular shape. But the way it's designed, you, you, you can't tell. Um, again, just like uh, Saint Eustache, it combines flamboyant Gothic and Renaissance elements. Four part rib vault in the nave, which is quite Gothic, with another hanging keystone in the choir, very elaborate uh, vault. Renaissance rounded arches along the arcades. And interestingly, the arcades are uncovered. They just, they're, they're just pillars with a little walkway over the pillars, essentially between the pillars, but nothing that goes all the way to the wall. Very unusual. Lits in a lot more light. And famously, uh, saint Etienne du Mont has the only rude screen or jubé in French in Paris. All churches had rude screens at one time, but they were done away with in the Counter-Reformation. And the point of the rude screen, and this one is very elaborate, uh, sometimes they're wood, sometimes they're carved stone, as this one is, uh, is to separate the choir where the clergy were from the congregation. In the old days in churches, up until the Counter-Reformation, uh, the clergy was seated in the choir and they held their services and the congregation couldn't see what was going on and couldn't hear what was going on. And they were standing in the choir. They didn't have seats back then. It's the facade that gets a lot of attention of saint Etienne du Mont uh, with its pilasters, pilasters. It's triangular pediment over the front door and then above that an arched pediment. And look at this uh, image of the Lesco wing of the Louvre, which was built, decorated by Jean Goujon. And you can see the very same elements, the arched and triangular pediments with pilasters. Very elaborate sculptural de decorations as well. If you look at saint Etienne du Mont, you can't help but notice the, the unusual dramatic bell tower that was uh, actually built at a very early stage, but then raised to a height with the addition of a lantern and this magnificent circular turret uh, attached to it, which is a, a hidden staircase or a staircase. 
Yet another assassination occurred um, when uh, Henri Cat was killed by a Catholic zealot, François Ravaillac, uh, in 1610. Ravaillac, he too was drawn and quartered as a result. Louis, uh, Henri Cat was succeeded by his eldest son, Louis XIII. Paris, uh, 10 years later, was elevated from a diocese to an archdiocese, no longer under the supervision of Saint. And Louis XIII was much under the influence of his very Catholic mother, Marie de Medici, and he reasserted Catholicism. And I should have mentioned in 1598, the Edict of Nantes uh, was promulgated by Henri IV, which uh, was an edict tolerating religion, tolerating Protestants. And, uh, and that was the high point in terms of to religious tolerance. Well, from that time until 1610, the death of Henri IV. And then starting in 1610 with the uh, accession of Louis XIII, uh, the tolerance began to decline dramatically. But it resulted in two things. First, a uh, push uh, for Catholicism, and second, push for church building. Louis XIII was admirably um, helped by Cardinal Richelieu, who is often considered to be the first modern prime minister. He was an extremely strong leader. But the Huguenots pushed back against the, the loss of uh, toleration under Louis XIII, and they had rebellions uh, in the southwest of France in the 1620s. In particular, this just shows you the kind of areas where the Protestants were located. And their main stronghold was in the city, the port city of La Rochelle, which was virtually entirely Protestant. And the uh, Louis XIII just, with uh, Richelieu decided that he could not tolerate uh, opposition to his rule. So he put it under siege and ultimately uh, the city um, capitulated after 14 months of siege. Which finally brings us to the Baroque churches of Paris over this 150 year period. It started, the Baroque thing with the, it's initiated really reflects the Counter-Reformation, which started with the Council of Trent, Trento in Italy. And in among other things, the Council of Trent encouraged church building, which as I said in Paris, didn't start for another 60 years or more because of the wars of religion. It abolished rude screens, and it was no longer necessary for churches to face east. Two interesting facts. And that liberation thing continues, but if you go to churches, you see the altars that are now at the very front of the um, nave in the, the back of the choir. And, and that was actually, uh, that came much later as part of Vatican II, when, uh, because under the Council of Trent, the, the the altar still faced uh, to the end of the church, not facing the congregation. So this is the Paris of Louis XIII. If you ha had time, we could go through this. I just highlighted the view looking south from the Vue de Chaumont uh, and all these numbers, these, each of those buildings has, or a lot of those buildings have numbers etched on them identifying what they are in the bottom there. And many, many, many of them are churches. If anybody can tell me what the big, uh, looks like a monastery to me at the bottom, uh, I'd be grateful because it doesn't have a number on it and I can't figure it out. I don't think it's Montmartre, uh, but it's probably some monastery or abbey outside the Charles V wall. Read the Baroque style, also known as French classicism. It rejects Protestant austerity and it has elaborate facades, domes, barrel vaults. And the churches are aligned with the street, which doesn't mean that they're facing east anymore. The facades in the new Baroque style 
are built on two or three levels of columns with classical orders, in the classical orders. The earliest Baroque churches in Paris, Saint-Gervais and Saint-Proté, uh, Saint-Joseph des Carmes and Chapelle de la Sorbonne. Saint-Gervais and Saint-Proté had the first Baroque facade in Paris, but no dome. This is the church that's right behind the Hotel de Ville. Three levels of columns in the classical orders. At the bottom, the simplest Doric, middle Ionic, and at the top, the most elaborate Corinthian. Ionic is scrolls. The rest of the church, literally, they stuck this Renaissance facade on a Gothic church. The nave is largely in the uh, Gothic style, although like uh, Santa Stash, uh, it does have these rounded semicircular arches in the arcades and not pointed as in the Gothic style. Nave ceiling with rectangular rib vaults, uh, key, six keystones in the flamboyant Gothic style. Wonderful photo uh, uh, of the church during the, uh, the reconstruction of Paris, essentially, by Osman. They planted a, a new orm, a new elm tree in front of it because there used to be an elm tree there from the Middle Ages. And the idea was, attendez-nous sur moi sur l'orme. That's where you would pay your debts in the old days. It was built on a mound. One of the earliest places uh, occupied on the on the left bank because it was a, a marais, a marsh. Behind it is the wonderfully colorful Rue des Bar. And on the north side, it uh, is covered by uh, this line of 11 adjacent houses built by La Fabrique Saint-Gervais. Fabrique is the name of the organization that kind of managed the church. And these were rental houses built for income they hide the nice north side of the church. And thanks to, Os once upon a time, they were level with the street, but Osman uh, brought the level of the street down in order so you didn't have to go up and down while crossing Paris, requiring the construction of those steps to lead up to the entrance to the buildings. Next church, Saint Eglise, or the Eglise Saint Joseph de Carmes on the left bank, and it was the first dome in Paris. But the first really good dome in Paris was at the Chapelle de la Sorbonne, which interestingly has two entrances. This is the one facing the Place de la Sorbonne and the Rue Saint-Michel at the top arrow. And then there's another entrance, which is from the Cour d'Honneur of the Collège du Sorbonne, de Sorbonne. Uh, which was commissioned by Richelieu when he was prime minister. Uh, he was also the, an alumnus and principal of the Sorbonne and he totally rebuilt it. So what you see on the Cour d'Honneur, he, he built all the buildings around this Cour d'Honneur and the, the chapel, uh, I, the, replacing, so there's nothing that is left from the original uh, 13th century Collège du Sorbonne and not much left, frankly, from the 17th century uh, uh, Collège de Sorbonne, except the chapel. This is an elevation by Jacques-François Blondeau, who did a number, he was an arch French architect, who did a number of studies of uh, how these um, amazing domes were built. We're now gonna go through a, a, a line of Baroque churches on the right bank of Paris along the east-west axis. So here's that map that we showed earlier, saw earlier, the Plan de Marion, and it's looking east. And at the very top uh, arrow points to the Bastille, which protected the, west, the eastern entrance to Paris and the, the wall of Charles V. Then, and it led to the Rue Saint-Antoine, which is still there, which in turn led to the Rue Saint-Honoré, which is still there which led ultimately to the Porte Saint-Honoré at the western end of the Charles V wall. 
And this was the major east-west axis on the right bank of Paris until the construction of the Rue de Rivoli by Osman in the mid 19th century. And we're gonna quickly go through these five churches, all of which are, were built on that east-west axis and not one of them faces east as a re result of the uh, Council of Trent. They face north, south, and west, but not east. First one, starting from the east and working our way west is the Église Sainte-Marie de la Visitation, just inside, just next to the Bastille, with an impressive dome, a nice rounded arch over the triangular tympanum above the front entrance, spectacular cu cupola. 1871, that was the commune. So you can see that this church suffered serious damage, largely repaired by 1887. Further west, we've got two churches, Saint Paul and Saint Louis. On the Rue Saint Antoine. The, Rue, the, the Église Saint Paul there was uh, the royal church that was part of the, uh, the Palais uh, Saint Paul, that area it was part of a palace complex. But ultimately, during the revolution, it was demolished. And there is a, still this vestige of the wall standing on the Rue Saint Paul. And in honor of that church, they renamed the church Saint Louis to the church Église Saint Paul Saint Louis, which is located just a little bit further west uh, and was built in this spectacular Baroque style with three levels of facades with the columns in the classical order as well. There's actually a great dome, but if uh, it was an early dome and you couldn't even tell it was there unless you went back all the way to the Rue des Francs Bourgeois. Now you can see the dome. <clears throat> the nave, looking at the cupola uh, and the choir beyond, rounded arches, very elaborate decoration. Seen from the back, uh, obviously the dome is very prominently visible. If you stand further back, on the Rue des Jardins Saint Paul, you see a remnant of the Philippe Auguste wall, the largest single remnant. I think it's about 200 yards long, um, which was discovered only in the 20th century. Moving further west, we get to the Oratoire du Louvre, and then beyond that, the Église Saint Roche. Oratoire du Louvre. Oratory is a name that's used for Protestant churches. Sometimes temples are as well. This one went through many, many changes. It used to be attached more or less, or just adjacent, shall we say, to the Louvre. This is looking at it from the east facade. It was a royal chapel at the beginning and ended up being a Protestant temple. This is looking north. And where we would now be is be from the Rue de Rivoli. has an unusual oval chapel. And there's a, uh, again, from the uh, Plan de Turgot, you, you see the church before it has its great portal, its great Western, it's actually Northern facades. You see it faces South, this church, and it was kind of connected to the, the Cour Carré. Uh, and uh, the, what separate, and then it was separated from the Louvre by the construction of the Rue de Rivoli by Osman. The Baroque portal was added on uh, 1744 to 1746, two story. The Chevet before the construction of the Rue de Rivoli. and this gallery, which was built by Victor, Victor Baltar, the same fellow who built uh, Leal, 
city architect. And it's behind it, you can see against the uh, Chevet is a, ma uh, a monument to the very Protestant Admiral de Coligny, who was assassinated on St. Bartholomew's Day and defenestrated. Further down the street again, the Église saint Roch with another very recognizable Baroque facade, two-story vault, sing, uh, barrel vault ceiling, rounded arched uh, arcades, very colorful decorations. Chapel designed by Jules Ardouin Monsard, who uh, also did the, such a, the uh, dome church. And this is where Bonaparte famously fired on royalist rebels in 1795, getting the attention of the authorities who started promoting him because this was a man who took no prisoners. And the fifth church uh, on the Rue Saint-Honoré or on the east-west axis is the Église Notre-Dame de l'Assomption, which is a now, it, this one is facing east, uh, west, not east. It's facing exactly the wrong way uh, from the old orientation practices. Right next to what the, uh, on the right top there is the Jardin des Tuileries. And on the left next to it is the Place Louis Le Grand, which is the Place de Vendôme. It's a huge dome and the entire church is under it. So the church is a rotunda. And it's now, what did I say? It's uh, the Polish church since 1844. So now we get to Louis XIV. And the end of religious tolerance, which had been in decline since Louis the Thirteenth, and he he revoked the Edict of Nantes in 1685, and once again Catholicism was the state religion of France. The Huguenots uh, had to convert or else, so a lot converted but 2,000 out of now a population of 800,000 reduced from 2 million 150 years earlier uh, fled. It was called Le Refuge. And where did they go? They went to England, Netherlands, and Germany in particular. And many from England then went on to the North American British colonies 800 to New York, mainly to Manhattan and Staten Island, 500 to South Carolina. When I went to Charleston a few years ago, I was surprised to discover that it had a major uh, Huguenot population, uh, 200 to New England, 500 to Virginia. Baroque churches in Paris on the left bank that were built during the reign of Louis XIV. Well, Anne d'Autrice, his mother, uh, was married for something like 23 years uh, before she finally gave birth to a son and heir, Louis Dieudonné, Louis the God-given, the future Louis the Fourteenth, or uh, Louis the Fourteenth, and she was so grateful for this unexpected event that she uh, commissioned the construction of the Val de Grasse Church, an absolutely spectacular Baroque church at the top of the Rue. Uh, Saint-Jacques in the fifth arrondissement. Enormous dome. Further east, um, Louis XIV uh, Louis XIV finished. Uh, um, his mother, Anne d'Autriche, Anne of Austria, laid the first stone of the Val de Grasse, but it was finished by her son. Uh, and her son went on to build two spectacular other churches on the left bank. At the, he built the hospital La Salpetriere, named Salt Peter Hospital, because I, they used to make saltpeter out there. It was on the edge of town, plenty of space. 
So he used that empty spot to build this gigantic hospital. Louis Laveau, the same architect who did um, Versailles. And it's now next to the Gare d'Austerlitz. And that gigantic dome is the chapel for this gigantic hospital. On the other end of Paris, on the west side of Paris, uh, Louis XIV built the Hotel des Invalides, which was a, a hospital for his army uh, veterans who, uh, who came back injured, uh, uh, disabled, uh, or they retired and it was a place for them to go to spend their last days, the magnificent Royal Hotel of the Invalides, 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 the people who have been injured. And to complement the Hotel des Invalides, which had its own church actually, still does, was built the Dome Church on the south side of it by uh, Jules Ardouin Monsard, who also went on to uh, build, succeed Laveau at uh, Versailles with a spectacular Baroque facade and even more spectacular dome. The top one is looking from the Esplanade des Invalides. The bottom one is looking from the, the church to the, to the Cour d'Honneur, the Honor Courtyard. Visited by Louis XIV on the 4th of July, 1701. And you can see that there is absolutely nothing in that area. He picked a greenfield location. But once the, the church was built and the, the Hotel des Invalides was built, then the area around it, particularly between that and the Louvre, started to fill out, creating the new Saint-Germain neighborhood of, of Paris. Uh, today, the Hotel des, uh, the Dome Church is not famous for uh, the crypt of Napoleon's sarcoph sarcophagus, which was installed there during the reign of Louis Philippe. Uh, the sarcophagus was designed by Louis Visconti. Louis had the longest reign of any king. Uh, he started very young and he ended very old. He presided over Le Grand Siècle. And he was succeeded by his great grandson, amazingly enough, uh, Louis XV, who also had a very long reign and presided over the Siècle des Lumières, the Enlightenment. And I'm going to end by talking about one last church that was built basically under the reign of Louis XV, uh, the Église Saint-Sulpice, which like so many churches took in this case up roughly a hundred years to build. These were not slapped up in a short period of time. And it replaced a Romanesque church built uh, in the area uh, back in the 12th century. There's the church on the left and on the right, uh, the arrow is pointing to a seminary, the Seminaire de Saint-Sulpice, which was the first seminary in France, actually. And it, it stood there until beyond the construction of the church, as you can see. The design uh, of the West facade, which is so famous for all of us with its pepper shaker uh, and salt uh, grinder, I should say, uh, towers was designed by an Italian architect, Gio Giovanni Niccolo, Francisized as Jean Nicolas Servandoni, who included in his design a, a dramatic pediment, which was later removed. And he was inspired by Christopher Wren's facade of St. Paul's Cathedral in London, as you can see clearly here. There is the pediment, but it was removed uh, later. And on the, uh, so this church faces, because it replaced an old church before the, 
the uh, Council of Trent, uh, it still is uh, east facing. So we always know that the North Tower is on the left and the South Tower is on the right. Um, no, no pet of them in, anymore. It's got a balustrade up there. And the South Tower, uh, let, let, so they were built, uh, Servandoni built his towers and on the left, it was rebuilt. The North Tower was rebuilt by Jean Chalgrin in a neoclassical style. And the plan was to rebuild the South Tower in the same style, but it never happened. Which is why the North Tower is taller and in a totally different style uh, from the South Tower. The Place Saint Sulpice followed with the, uh, the demolition of the seminary and the construction of the magnificent fountain of four bishops, designed again by Louis Visconti. Nave with rounded arches, inner choir with pilasters, the crossing of the, the transept and the nave with barrel vault ceiling. This chapel, this church is also famous for fa its Chapel of the Holy Angel paintings by Eugène Delacroix. Just to the right when you go in, it's one chapel surrounded by paintings on the walls and on the ceiling. It has the old biggest organ in Paris over the, hmm, I guess it's, I believe it's uh, over the entrance. And that brings us to Louis the 16th, the neoclassical period highlighted by the Pantheon and the revolution, which changed everything. So more about all of that next week. Thank you very much. So, Isabel. Je regarde pour voir si Isabelle est avec nous pour la modération. To moderate the question, thank you, Russell. Um, wonder if she went to the other link a little early. So, uh, apologies if this happened. Uh, Paprika, okay. maybe you want to reach out to Isabelle and make sure she can come back with us. Okay. So I will uh, just, uh, hello, Allison. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I will answer a question that uh, Allison posed last week that I didn't know the answer to, but uh, she and my wife uh, prov provided an answer in the meantime, which was uh, in the context of Gothic churches, uh, did they use mortar? And I said, I didn't know. And the reason I said I didn't know is because if you look at these churches, the stones are incredibly tightly packed. You, you can't see mortar in between them. They're just, a, a, I read in one thing that the tolerance or the, di the distance between stones was never more than five millimeters, uh, which is like a quarter of an inch. So there, it, you can't see any mortar. Nevertheless, they did use mortar. And uh, as was ex uh, explained, the, the, so there, the stones are limestone and the mortar is also based on limestone. What they would do is kind of burn and crush the limestone to create a powder, add sand to it, add um, water to it, and then smear it on the side of the stones. And those two would fuse. So it's, it, it's, it's not like with brick and, and, and cement, how you can see it's spilling out, uh, but there would be a very thin layer of this mortar uh, that would essentially uh, glue the, the pieces together. So the answer is yes, they did use mortar um, and it was a very special, uh, very effective kind of mortar. Merci, Russell. I remember that question from uh, last week, uh, wondering how so many stone could 
stay be fitted so well and so precisely together um and a little mortar un petit peu de mortier always help doesn't it uh there's a question by from Beth Chadur uh so many of these churches have no pews just chairs is that common and actually that's a question I had last last mm -hmm. week too because often in those churches you go there and it's just a bunch of chairs that can, can be moved mm -hmm. so how about mm. those pews? When when did this happen? Well, I, I don't I don't know the answer. I do, I can tell you that uh, some uh, uh, some churches have pews, some have have um, have chairs. But as as I did say earlier, when talking about the jubé, the uh, brood screens, in, in the old days they didn't have chairs either. Well, it's kind of like in, if you went to the Globe Theater. Uh, in the day of Shakespeare, which is, by the way, roughly the same period we're talking about here, they didn't have chairs either. You stood up during the performance. Well, similarly, uh, in churches, they st uh, the congregation stood up, uh, the average congregant. Uh, and then they started to, I don't know if it was a one church went for pews, one kind of religion went for pews, and another went for churches. Um, I, I don't know when the the pews came in compared to the chairs. So it went for chairs rather not churches. Interesting question. Maybe I'll answer it next time. <laughs> that's it. Or if someone, as we say on the line, can do it, uh, yeah. that's great. Uh, Isabel's back. Thank you, Isabel. I know you're in France. I think we lost contact. But uh, to you, uh, please, uh, there's a few questions on the chat. Uh, merci d'être de, de retour. Yes, I'm sorry, I had uh, technical issues. So yes, Russell, thank you so much for this amazing uh, presentation and we may have some questions for you. Uh, and you know, um, regarding uh, the last talk, the one that you did last week, you remember you had um, a question that you, you were not able to answer at this time, no. but you now, <laughs> I, I think that you did some researches and uh, it was a question regarding the material used uh, for the construction of the Gothic Cathedral and it seems that now you have the answer. Yes, and, and while you were reconnecting, I gave it. Ah, you did it, fantastic, <laughs> yeah. it's yeah. done. Okay, 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 okay. okay. Uh, so let's see the chat. So uh, yes, there is one question for you. Uh, I was wondering why they didn't do the second tour at the first one for the Saint Sulpice Church. What was the reason they didn't have time, or maybe the architect didn't want? Well, well, this is this is a phenomenon that happens time and time again when you look at churches. For example, a, a Saint Eustache Church, they they ran out of money, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and they said they never built the South Tower for the Saint Eustache Church. Same thing with the uh, with Saint Sulpice, but it's it was worse in a way because there the, it, the revolution came, and so nobody was building any churches during the revolution, as we will discuss next week. But yes, a lot of church building uh, occurred in fits and starts, depending on how much money was available, and sometimes they just literally would stop. So many times they, they would build the facade, but not the towers, and then later they build one tower. And maybe they would build the other one, but sometimes they would be built at different centuries and in totally different styles. So it, it had to do with funding uh, to a large extent. Okay, and, so yeah, but it was not always a question of time. It was sometimes because of, yes, it could be because they have no time, but it could be financial uh, reason. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and Somewhere along the line, people just gave up and said, okay, we will leave it unfinished. Uh, and because now if we do it, we, well, we, we still don't have the funds or we want to preserve this interesting contrast between a, a flamboyant yeah. Gothic uh, tower and a early Gothic tower, for example. Okay. We have a question from uh, Alison Rona. I briefly saw a triple dome construction in a cross-section drawing you showed of Le Dome des Invalides. I'm guessing that allowed for greater height. I didn't hear the beginning part. I briefly saw a triple dome construction in a cross-section drawing yeah. you show of Le Dome des Invalides. 
uh, okay. Uh, it's certainly, I mean, the, the Dome des Amelies is, 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 is huge. It's, it's one of the very highest, it, it competes with the highest steeples uh, of France uh, in terms of height. So yes, it was an, uh, uh, the construction of the dome was an, an attempt to get very high, number one. And uh, one of the things about the Dome des Invalides is that it looks huge, it looks too big. But if you think about it, if you look at it for a while, all of a sudden, it's not too big, but it, it is a, a massive dome. And it's also quite interesting to realize that it was built at the same time uh, roughly as the Royal Hospital in uh, London. The Royal Hospital in London uh, was similarly a hospital for war veterans, wounded war veterans and, and retired soldiers. And it has a very modest little dome on it. Uh, but this, this, as does frankly, the one in uh, Trafalgar Square. But uh, the French domes, the Parisian domes are anything but modest. They're huge. And there is no bigger one than uh, the Dome Church des Invalides. Okay, maybe you have one last question. Um, Mia uh, said um, during the post Second Vatican Council, churches in some regions began taking out chairs. And she said, sorry, kneelers and pews. Do you confirm? Uh, I have no idea. <laughs> but Maybe I mean, the, 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 whole, the, the whole point of the, the Vatican II, uh, just like the, the uh, just like the Council of Trent, was to get people to come back. Yeah. Uh, so the, the, the idea was that you wanted to make the church accessible. You wanted to make it easy for people to come to church. So you took down the rood screen. You, you could see the, the priest praying. Um, whether they put in chairs or took out chairs, I don't know, but the same thing with the with the Vatican II. The idea was to make it more user friendly, make the church more user friendly, put in a vernacular so you could you could give the mass in uh, the local language. It didn't have to be in Latin. Uh, the priest was facing the congregation, so you could hear and see him. Uh, so uh, those those were two huge moves to try to make the church, the Catholic church more accessible uh, and com more competitive um, with the Protestant churches. But it is on season, absolutely. Yeah. Mm. But interestingly, while the Protestant churches went for austerity, lack of, of uh, flamboyance and elaborate decoration and so on, the, uh, the counter-reformation churches doubled down on that and had extremely uh, elaborate uh, decor and sculpture. Thank and, you so and... much. Thank you so much, Russell, but it's time to close this lecture. It was really a true pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you also to our partners for their support. Thank you for all the participants. Thank you so much for being with us every week. Uh, see you next week. We have uh, another rendezvous. So it's going to be on Thursday, February 2nd, for the neoclassical churches of, of before and after the revolution. This changed everything, including the Pantheon. It's going to be at noon in Chicago Central Time, 1 p.m. in Miami Eastern Time, 6 p.m. in the UK, and 7 p.m. in France. Thank you so much and see you next week. So don't forget, mark your calendar, it's Thursday, February 2nd. Merci, au revoir. Au revoir à tous. Au revoir.